The review embargo on Nvidia's latest flagship, the RTX 5090, a $2,000 graphics card has lifted. And when it comes to this card's performance and the value proposition, it's turned out to be exactly what I had expected. I can't really say that I'm underwhelmed or disappointed because I knew this was going to happen. And don't get me wrong, if you're looking for a beast of a GPU that can handle 4K gaming, this is the card to get. But man, did Nvidia really stretch it when they tried to oversell everyone on Blackwell. It's no wonder the consensus amongst reviewers has dubbed this card as the 4090 Ti. Let's discuss that in this video. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey what is going on guys, Danny here, welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. I wanted to make this video for you guys to give you my thoughts on the RTX 5090 now that we finally have independent review data out on the web since the embargo has lifted. From the type of reception I'm seeing and what seems to be the general consensus, the RTX 5090 it's kind of underwhelming or mid if we're being honest here. But what happened? Nvidia was hyping up this card like crazy, making bold claims suggesting it's 2-4x faster than an RTX 4090. And hey, some reviewers did showcase that in the reviews, being able to run Cyberpunk 2077 on ultra settings with path tracing, and getting over 200 FPS at 4K certainly looks remarkable at a glance. However, that is until you look deeper into it and realize this is all achieved through a gimmick called multi-frame generation. And we've talked about this before on the channel when the series was first unveiled, along with the specifications being listed. It became quite obvious that the RTX 5090 was going to be around 30% faster overall against the 4090 outside of any upscaling or multi-frame generation involved. We're not going to be taking a look at a plethora of benchmarks as we just don't have the time here and I'd much rather try to get my hands on it so I can bring you guys some more benchmarks based on the type of testing that I do. But once again, I urge you all to take a look at as many reviews as possible to attain data from a variety of sources. So if you're considering buying one, you'll know what you're mainly paying for. Computer based throughout their results found that overall, it was about 24% faster on average in pure rasterization, and they found a similar 22% margin when it comes to ray tracing. Tech Power Up in their suite found that overall, it was a larger gap at 35% in pure raster between the 5090 and 4090. TechSpot's review posted by Hardware Unboxed found that the 5090 was about 27% faster on average. And these are the differences discovered at 4K, by the way, which is the most sensible resolution, or rather, I'd say the only resolution you should be using this graphics card for, because reviewers did also showcase 1080p and 1440p data, and the gap between the two cards was even narrower. Like at 1080p, this is basically a 4090, give or take. In some instances, the 5090 had even lost to the 4090, suggesting that Blackwell's overhead is higher than ADA and more prone to running into a CPU bottleneck. So don't buy this card unless you're gaming at 4K or doing some heavy ray tracing at 1440p or using a very high upscaled ultra wide monitor. So around 25 to 35% faster at 4K than a 4090, and that seems to line up exactly with the predictions we had of this graphics card based on the specs and some of the preliminary data that Nvidia had put out. Now given that we're not dealing with any node shrinks, expecting some sort of a huge leap in performance like we had going from Ampere, the RTX 30 series to Ada Lovelace to 40 series is unreasonable because that was an 8 nanometer node which was really just a tweak 10 nanometer node from Samsung and then we went to TSMC's 5nm so there was like almost a two node jump there. So a 30-ish percent improvement in this case isn't bad, and that's what I would say if it weren't for two glaring problems. The first is power consumption, and I found Ali from Optimum Tech had a really decent segment in his review highlighting the issue here. The RTX 3090 had a TDP rating of 350 watts and consumes around that much power typically in games. Now while the 4090 has a rated TDP of 450 watts, typically in games it would be consuming lower than that, and in some cases drawing even less power than a 3090, and that is something I can vouch for as I own both of these graphics cards. So it was very efficient when comparing the two. The RTX 5090 on the other hand is a total power hog, consuming power in the high 400 to the mid 500 wattage range. Like we're looking at a 20% to 50% increase in power consumption and this was noted by multiple reviews across the board. 
So this is something definitely to take into consideration, especially if you live in a region where electricity costs aren't particularly low. On top of that, you also have to deal with higher temps. Now, I've seen a lot of reviewers complain that the Founders Edition model exhibited quite a lot of coil wine. I guess that's to be expected when you're shoving that much power into such a compact PCB. With that said, thermals for a two-slot card handling that much wattage sure is impressive. However, the second glaring issue that comes into play is pricing. And we discussed this in my previous video, but we do have some more information coming out surrounding pricing and availability, so I did also want to follow up on that. Price to performance using the Founders Edition or NVIDIA's MSRP is going to not apply to a lot of people because the Founders Edition can only be purchased from a select few retailers, and it's only going to be available in a few regions around the world. That means a lot of people are going to have to buy third-party AIB custom models. And those models, even some of the most cheapest models, are still marked up considerably over MSRP. So BH Photo Video, they're a pretty large electronics retailer, and there were some prices leaked which a user posted to the NVIDIA subreddit. This list consists of a bunch of AIB RTX 5090 and 5080 graphics cards. If any of you are wondering roughly how much ASUS was going to charge for their top of the line top tier astral graphics card while well, you're looking at over $800 in MSRP. Even their tough model is listed for around $500 over MSRP and typically we've seen tough cards priced relatively close to MSRP. Nothing to this kind of extent. The most cheapest model is from MSI. This is their Ventus design which I still think looks pretty darn good even if it's their quote unquote budget model but even that is going for about $2,200. Now to be fair it's not like AIB 4090s were going for MSI. SRP as well, but I wasn't seeing markups to this kind of extent and some of the lower end models were selling for pretty close to MSRP. Also, there's more sources coming out stating how initial supply is going to be abysmal. So if you're still interested in getting a 5090, good luck. When you put it all together, you're looking at a graphics card that while is offering around 30% better performance over the last generation flagship, it's doing so while costing you 30% more if not higher and also consuming 30% plus power as well. So in terms of a gen on gen pr improvement, there really isn't anything happening here. Hence, you had a lot of reviewers and folks within the community calling this the 4090 Ti. It's totally Ada Lovelace on steroids. Again, not saying that this is anything surprising, but what needs to be really hammered down here is the fact that the main selling point here is DLSS4, and that's really about it. When it comes to gaming, at least, because I know there's a number of workstation benchmarks where the 5090 will shine, but that isn't the main topic of this video. Now, gaming with DLSS4, FSR, FrameGen, all of this is going to be really, really subjective. I'm seeing that there's two camps here, and there isn't really a side here that I'd say is overwhelming the other. One camp says they're totally on board with DLSS4 and frame generation, while the other says that they would die before using it. With that said, the impressions I've seen from reviewers makes me believe that DLSS4's transformer model may be what gets a lot of these people who've been on the fence to finally try it out or on board. You can actually try it out now if you have an NVIDIA GPU, at least using the upscaling portion of DLSS4, and from what I've been hearing, it's a dramatic improvement. You can try it out in Cyberpunk's latest patch, so much so that people are going to such lengths and stating that even performance mode, which usually looks all fuzzy, is on par with native. So that's a big bold claim. At the end of the day, it's all just anecdotal evidence, and like I said, it's one of those big subjective features where you're going to have to try it out for yourself. The same goes for multi-frame generation. I'm hearing a lot of positive feedback around it. The latency penalty, even when using the 4x frame gen mode, isn't as high as you'd think, and I've seen many say that the most it incurred was like a 5 millisecond penalty, which wouldn't even be that noticeable. Especially if you're playing a single player title, and in that scenario, people are typically a lot more tolerant. But that's ultimately what it's going to come down to, not just for the 5090, but for the entire RTX 50 series. Forget about raster and raw performance improvements. Don't expect much in these categories. You're only going to be setting yourself up for disappointment. It's going to come down to how much better they can make these AI features, because compared to a native experience, they're not totally far off. More and more people are getting on board with it and utilizing it to some degree. In the end, the RTX 5090 feels more like a proof of concept for NVIDIA's AI-driven features rather than a generational leap in traditional performance. While it does offer a notable improvement over the RTX 4090, especially in those AI-enhanced gaming and productivity workloads, the steep price 
the higher power consumption, and the reliance on features like DLSS4 leave a lot to be desired for gamers purely looking at raw performance. For those who are already running a 4090, the upgrade simply doesn't seem justifiable, and I can't believe it was even a thought for some of the people out there, unless you're committed to exploring those latest AI-driven advancements. Though, I can see a lot of folks on older cars from the 30 series and, you know, the 20 series or even older than that being a lot more enticed to upgrade. But for everyone else, it's hard to ignore the growing price to performance gap that Nvidia has created. The RTX 5090 might be the flagship GPU of today, but it's clear that the gaming community is starting to expect more, both in innovation and in accessibility. We shall see how this impacts the future of the GPU market. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.